love to talk about carrots and incentives, the Agile mindset. How many of you are doing Agile of some form? Ah, okay, most. Why did you decide to do that? Uh, because you looked at the extensive, scientific, <laughs> randomly controlled experiments that clearly show that Agile is better. How many of you did that? Uh, did anyone do that? Ah, good. This is a trick question. Just like the Berlin Conference. Because there aren't any. You decided to do Agile because you heard that someone else was doing it. And it sounded like a good idea. So what I'm going to try to talk about today has to do with scientific experiment, not just my opinion. So we know that way back when there was a very famous Russian guy who did some experiments with dogs. And he noticed that if he fed the dogs at the same time every day, that after a while all he had to do was come into the laboratory and the dogs would start salivating. Ooh, does this sound like software development? The dogs would start salivating even though they didn't have any food yet. So they thought, well, how can that be? Is it possible that the dogs can predict the future? Since reading about that research, I wondered if we should have dogs on our software teams to help us with estimation. In fact, there are controlled studies that show that's a pretty good idea. Dogs are better than we are at a lot of things. So they discovered it wasn't that the dogs could predict the future, it was that they knew by looking at what was going on in the lab that they were getting ready to feed them so they could anticipate that. And out of that came a wonderful idea called behaviorism. The idea that if you prepare people for something over and over again, you can elicit or bring about the kind of behavior that you want by providing the right kind of incentive. That could be a positive incentive, a carrot, a negative incentive, a stick. And that's how you get animals, and I guess we are animals, aren't we? That's how you get animals to do what you want. Anyone know who this is? Who is it? Ah, no, 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 his name is Taylor. His name is Taylor. And he gets a lot of bad press. He was a very smart guy who studied how people work. And he was do doing it in the industrial age when he could measure how people were performing certain parts of the work on the assembly line. And he measured with the idea of trying to make that work more efficient. He said, work consists of mainly simple, not particularly interesting tasks. And the only way to get people to do them is to incentivize them properly and monitor them carefully. And he was right. He was talking about people who did the same thing over and over again, who worked on the assembly line, and by careful measurement, and by careful placement and usement of tools, he could improve their productivity. He was a very smart guy, a scientific, engineering type approach that revolutionized the way people think about how we work. And it was effective for the time. Now those of you who are agile, who have moved from waterfall or some other process have done so because you have a belief in a different way of working. And what we notice about that new way of working is that there are some leftovers, not just from waterfall, but a lot of leftovers from the industrial age. And this is one of them. The idea that to get people to work in a more productive fashion, 
to be more efficient, that somehow the right incentive will bring that about. What we know is that Taylor was able to prove that with scientific experiments. And he was able to do that at a time when what he was doing was appropriate, the idea of incenting people. But now, I'm not so sure. I won't ask you to raise your hands, but I know there are lots of managers who certainly believe that. But somehow if we can just optimize the environment, that we will get the best from people. The really sad thing about this is that we have bought into it ourselves. So for those of you who are going to be around long enough to take a class I'm going to teach on better ways of thinking, one of the problems we face is that unless we feel we're working heads down in front of a computer, that we're not really being productive. <coughs> Let's take another survey. How many of you have sat for a long time in front of a computer, staring at that computer screen, working, working, working on a problem? Anyone in here ever done that? Ah, very good. Okay, let's see how long. What's the longest amount of time you've ever sat without getting up? So sitting, sitting, sitting. Not getting up to go to the toilet. Not getting up to go have a piece of pizza. Not getting up to go have a cup of coffee. Sitting, sitting, sitting in front of the computer. What's the longest amount of time? Can you give me a number? Anybody? Oh, come on. Two hours. <laughs> Two hours, any point, more than two. Just go to the toilet. Sorry? I go to the toilet. No, but... sorry, no, no, no. Eight hours. Eight. eight hours? You sat for eight hours? You didn't get up? This is a woman. You should be a little more sane than that. Eight hours. Anybody more than eight? Wow, eight hours. She's got her head down now. She's working <laughs> eight hours. Would you like to know the record? <laughs> the record until going to Chicago was 13 hours. You want to think about that? 13 hours. Not getting up to go to the toilet. Sitting. Staring. And when those individuals said 13 hours, I said, you sat for 13 hours without moving. And the response in both cases, and these were guys, the response in both cases was, yes, but I solved the problem. <laughs> that is to imply that that is the best way to solve the problem by sitting, by staring, by not moving. That is industrial age thinking. That if you take a break, if you take a nap, if you walk around and go outside because the weather is so beautiful, that that is not working. So no wonder, we're still living in the early 1900s in how we think about work, in how we think about productivity. I think it's time to look at the new research. In 1949, there was a guy named Harry Harlow who did an interesting experiment. We're going to talk about monkeys today. He was going to do some experiments with these little monkeys by having them work on puzzles. So he put the puzzles in the monkeys' cages, and before he could get started on the experiment, he noticed that the monkeys immediately started to solve the puzzles. And he thought to himself, and he said to his lab assistants, well, I wonder why they're starting to work on the puzzles. We haven't given them a treat yet. So he stopped, and he noticed that he didn't have to give them a treat, that the monkeys liked 
<laughs> working on the puzzles. They seem to enjoy it. They seem to think that it was a fun thing to do, even though there was no reward. There was no incentive. And at the time, this was a revolutionary result because scientists believed at this point that there were only two kinds of reasons why we did something. All animals, either because of some behavioral need that led us to eat or go to the toilet or have sex, or some kind of external reward. And he said it's clear that somehow these monkeys are doing it not because of some external reward, but because of something inside. And so he called that intrinsic, some kind of inner feeling that might be joy. It might be joy. And in fact, when he did further experiments, he found that when he did provide incentives, when he did have external rewards, the monkeys lost interest. <coughs> they didn't seem to enjoy the puzzles anymore. They would only work on them when there was a proper incentive, and they wouldn't just do it for joy. So the little note I have here is that he was almost afraid to publish this. And when he did finally publish the results, everyone ignored it. I like to think that scientists are objective and that they pay attention to all of the wonderful experiments they do. And instead, what we learn is that they hang on to their old beliefs as long as possible. A lot of you know that I'm interested in organizational change. And what we see in all kinds of different organizations is that people do that. They hang on to old ways for a lot of reasons, mostly fear. And that was true for the scientific community, who ignored the idea of an intrinsic motivation. They held on to their behavioralism for decades. Two interesting economists who changed the way we look at people forever. One of them, the one that was still alive, finally got a Nobel Prize for economics. They defined the field of behavioral economics. Economics used to believe that we were rational. Uh, let's take another survey. How many smart people in the room? Let's see, two, three. Lots of smart people in the room. So therefore, because you're smart, you're also rational, Wendy. Rational. One rational, thank you very much, one rational thinker at the back of the room. That's the foundation of classical economics, that we make rational decisions. So what Kahneman and Tversky showed is that we're not. And they did it with a series of interesting experiments. One of them is called the ultimatum game. And it works like this. In the experiment, I'm paired with someone else. So Martin and I have already been paired today by getting this fabulous recognition from the folks that go to. So we'd be paired up. And the experiment would give me a certain amount of money, let's say $10. So I have $10, and we play one round of the game where I can give Martin a certain part of that $10. And if he says, yes, Linda, I will take the amount that you have decided to give me, and if he does, then we both get to keep that amount of money. So let's suppose I say to Martin, hey, Martin, I've got $10, and I'll give you two. I'll 
occupied. Would you take it? Oh, come Thank on. You. <laughs> Martin is very rational. What most people do in that circumstance around the world, not just in the U.S., is they refuse to take it unless it's about 50-50. If I offer him $4 or $5 or $6, typically they will say, sure, I'll take that. And now we both get to keep that amount of money. But if it isn't a fair split, they say, no, I'm not going to take that $2. Now, the question is, is that rational? We both get to keep the money. No matter what I offer Martin, when we walk out of the room, we're going to have more money than we did when we walked in. So it's only rational if he accepts any offer I make. But around the globe, people in all circumstances say, no, 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 if it isn't fair, I'm not going to take it. I would rather have nothing then let you have more than me. It's an emotional, it's not rational, it's an emotional reaction. We're concerned with fairness. All right, so for those of you who are religious, let's please say a little prayer to the computer gods, and we will see if this video works. A little bit of setup. This is an experiment with monkeys. And in the experiment, the monkeys are being taught to exchange a form of money for treats. So the monkey is given a token of some kind. The monkey returns the token and uses that token to buy certain kinds of treats. Now, in the beginning of the experiment, the monkey uses the token to buy a cucumber. Monkeys love cucumbers. But you'll notice in the experiment that the monkey that initially gets a cucumber can see that his neighbor next door, when he buys a treat with his token, is not getting a cucumber, but is getting a grape. Now, monkeys like cucumbers, but they love, they love grapes. So we shall see what happens. Oh, dear God, please make this video happen. I've been a good girl all year. Really, I have. I'm hoping. Ah, here we go. Here's the monkey getting the token. It says, ah, oh, great. And now he returns it, and he gets a cucumber. Yum, 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 yum. I love cucumbers. Here's the token. Okay, fine. Here you go. Give it back to me. And now I'm going to give you a nice, juicy grape. He said, what? Wait. I want, I, I want a grape, please. Give me a grape. Come on. What? Oh, no, no, no. No. That. <laughs> I want a grape. What are you doing with this cucumber stuff? I want a grape. Don't, no cucumber. Hey, he got another grape. This is not fair. I want a piece. Come on. All right, here's my chance. Maybe it's the token. Let me test this out. Come on, come on. Give it to me. All right, I, I want. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> this is not fair. There is no justice. I want a grape. How come he gets grapes and I don't get any? It runs pretty deep. runs pretty deep, our feeling that if it's not fair. So there's a program just recently in the United States where they wanted to encourage children to read. Reading is a good thing. Reading is an enjoyable thing. So they provided these children incentives, believing in that industrial age approach, that if you incent, you will get the behavior that you desire. And what they noticed is that 
children in order to reach their goal of having read a certain number of books in a certain amount of time would choose very small, easy to read <laughs> books so they could get more pizza. Now we know that in any experiment, and that's really what this is, we don't know how this is going to work out, when we offer the incentive program to children, it's an experiment and there are always unintended consequences. <laughs> children who would not read unless they had an incentive. And in fact, that's what the research shows, is that offering an incentive conveys a message to the participant. You wouldn't ordinarily want to do this, so we have to incent you in order to get the desired behavior. And what the participants learn then is that they're not going to do it unless they get the reward in the, in the future. So we're teaching them, in this case, teaching children that reading must not be a fun thing, an enjoyable thing. It must be something that requires some kind of reward in order for them to do this desired behavior. And of course, over time, in the United States, we are number one, we are the baddest nation on the face of the earth. Not only are we sitting too much, but we're eating way, way, All the research is clear that tangible rewards remove, in some cases, or work against the enjoyment or the intrinsic motivation. Studies on children, studies on young adults, studies on older people show clearly that when they are put in a setting where they're incented to do something, they learn to hate it. They learn to only do it when there is an incentive. They lose. They lose the joy. And of course, in any incentive scheme, as Steve said, I don't know if you're fans of Freakonomics, I listen to a lot of podcasts on airplanes. And the Freakonomics podcast is one of my favorites. Steve Levitt is an economist at the University of Chicago, and he said, no individual, no government, is ever going to be as smart as the people who are scheming against you. When you introduce an incentive scheme, no matter how clever you think you are, there's a pretty good chance that someone far more clever than you will figure out a way to beat incentive scheme. Dan Airely, who is a behavioral economist, has shown in a number of experiments that there is a correlation between the size of the bonus and the performance, but that correlation is negative. So the larger the incentive, the poorer the end result, the less productivity the less creativity, the less enjoyment. And even now, decades beyond behaviorism, in studies where he's asked MBA students and CEOs, what do you think would be the best way to get teams to be more productive, to encourage teams to be more creative, all of them seem to have bought into that industrial age practice that is all about carrots and sticks. Smart people continue to believe in the face of mounting evidence that the best way to get high performance out of people who solve complicated problems is to provide incentives. Now, there is some positive correlation, but it's only for those industrial age practices that are still around. If you do the same thing over and over again, if you're working on an assembly line tightening the bolt, yes, incentives do work. If you pay people more for the number of units produced, they will work faster. 
there's also a notion of closeness. If the thing you're trying to incent is exactly what you want, then incentives do work. I have a very good friend who lives in Stockholm, and she told me a story about having her children learn how to ski. And she said, I paid them every time they fell down. So the idea is that if they go out and try to fall down a lot, which they did, they will find a way around that incentive. So she didn't pay them to ski, she paid them for falling down. She knew that by falling down repeatedly and picking themselves up and going a little further and falling down again, that she was really getting uh, performance, an improved performance in ice skating. I thought that was brilliant. Google, we know, pays for anyone who can find problems with its browser and pay, in some cases, huge incentives, which is what they want to see. They're not paying for creativity. They want to find those problems. And then I just read a story about Zappos, who does extensive training of the people who come work for that company. And at the end of the training period, which lasts two weeks, they say to the gathered prospective employees, we will give you $3,000 to quit now. <laughs> Brilliant. Some do take it. And those would probably be the people you'd want to get rid of anyway. The ones who stay. So this is a plug for the influence strategies class and teaching along with the thinking class. Those who have already invested two weeks who say, no, 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 this is worth more to me than $3,000, those are the people that you want to keep around. Also been some interesting studies in different ways of applying incentives. And in one case, this was a study in China, the team that was given the bonus ahead of time saying, you've already got the bonus. And now we want to see if you make those performance objectives. And if you do, you get to keep the bonus. And they compared that behavior with another group where they were told, now, if you meet the stated objectives, we will give you a bonus. And what they found was, over and over again, because these experiments are repeated in different situations, that those teams that were given the bonus up front, who were said, you've already got it. As long as you meet those performance objectives, you can keep that bonus. Those people outperform the other group. So we don't like to lose things. We will increase performance if we're given the incentive ahead of time. I just finished reading an interesting book that was about, and I, I don't teach at university anymore, but if I did, I would like to try this experiment. So if any of you are teaching in university, try this. At the beginning of the class, say, everyone now has an A. Everyone's starting out with an A. Now, if we start having exams or programming assignments and we you don't know, do so well, we're going to take points away. But right now, everyone has an A. That somehow that turns on a very powerful force, which is called loss aversion in our brains. We hate to lose stuff. Even small amounts of things are very strong incentives. So the sense that the incentive of loss aversion is very powerful. We know that those people who are beginning to do something, they need certain kinds of incentives. They need praise. They need encouragement. They need positive feedback. Of course, you'll need to offer them suggestions for improvement, but the main thing beginners need is strong, positive, encouraging feedback. Experts, on the other hand, do much better with, all right, a little bit of praise, we all need some of that, but they do better with a lot of suggestions for improvement, things that point out areas where we need to get better. In other words, we more negative feedback. So those are also incentives. More positive for beginners, a little more critical and helpful suggestions for the experts. 
Here's what the neuroscientists tell us. Is there are two important areas in your brain that are involved in incentives. The one part has to do with reward or pleasure. That's where we get big shots of dopamine. We also know there's another center in the brain that has to do with cooperation. And on Agile teams especially, we're concerned with that, how teams work together. We know that in the brain there are conflicts and that these two centers do not operate at the same time. In other words, you can't both work for the incentive and cooperate. And when there's a conflict between those two areas of the brain, the way the architecture of the brain works is that we would go for pleasure every time over anything. And that will undermine our cooperative, helpful, collaborative efforts. It gets in the way of teamwork to provide individual incentives. We know that managers, for instance, have a very powerful effect as far as the incentive of encouraging people who run their teams. Look at the date of this paper. 1988. Now, I'm hoping that some of you will be really interested in this research and will send me an email saying, Linda, can you send me that paper or how can I read more about that information? In particular, if you are a manager and you haven't read this Harvard Business Review article, I encourage you, I have a copy of it. It's illegal. Shh, don't tell Harvard. Send me some email and I'll be happy to send a copy of the article. In 1988, they did a study that showed that managers who have certain beliefs about the people who work on their teams can actually affect the behavior. And they do so in a pretty short amount of time, long before they really have an understanding of the actual performance of that individual. <coughs> In fact, when I read the paper, I was really disturbed. I thought, I wonder if all managers do that. Do you suppose all managers make up their mind pretty quickly about someone? A new hire who comes in the door, they've already decided, the manager, whether this person is going to be okay or not. So I asked some friends, some friends who are managers, and I said, is that true? Do you really make up your mind so quickly? Even before you really know this person, have you already decided whether it could be okay or not? And my friend who was the manager said, well, Linda, I, I guess we do. Uh, yeah, maybe we do, but we're always right. Of course they are. And that was the message of the paper. Because the manager has already decided, the manager gives incentives of different kinds, feedback, rewards, maybe even bonuses or promotions based on those expectations. And on the basis of that feedback, performance of the okay individuals does get better, it improves. Whereas those who are not okay. They don't get the feedback. They don't get the incentives. They don't get the bonuses. They don't get the promotions. And their behavior deteriorates. So the managers create the kinds of behavior they expect. And what's even scarier is we all do that. We do that to each other. A lot of studies of military units to show that, okay, you can pay a certain amount of money, you can hire good people, but the thing that drives effective teams, the most important element in making a team effective, creative, productive, is how people feel 
how people feel about what they are doing, whether they think it's important or not, whether there is purpose. I have a good friend who trains rescue dogs, and when there's a major disaster, they bring in all the dogs they can. Some dogs are trained to find living people. Some dogs are trained to find people who are not living. So when all the dogs are brought in, and if it's really a major disaster, there are not going to be very many survivors. So the dogs that are trained to find living human beings get very depressed. And at the end of the day, very discouraged. So what the emergency workers do is they hide inside the rubble. So that at the end of the day, all the dogs who want to find a living human being can find a living human being. And it perks them up. They feel better. They feel they have done a good day's work, something worthwhile. They want to feel that they've made a, a contribution. I think some of these things are pretty deep. If you can see some of these feelings in dogs and monkeys, we've had them for a long time. Dan Early did some interesting experiments with Legos. Since I lived in Denmark for a year, I love Legos. They had two groups of people building robots out of Legos. They brought them in for the experiment. So there's group one and group two, and the arrangement was if you build a robot, we will pay you, in the beginning, three dollars. And then at the end, we'll ask you a question. Would you like to build another one? And if so, we're going to give you a little less than three dollars. I think it was two dollars and eighty cents. And then when you finish with the second one, we'll say, would you like to build another one? We'll give you a little less money. And you can keep on building as many robots as you want. Now, in the two groups, there was a big difference. One group built, on average, a little over 11 robots before they said, that's enough, I don't want to build any more robots. The other group only built about seven on average. A pretty big, statistically significant difference in the two groups. I wonder why. I wonder what the difference was between the two groups. Well, in group one, when the robot was built and they said, you want to build another one? They gave them another set of Legos and they displayed in a prominent place the first or the second one. Until when they had finished, they had a nice row of robots. So the participants could see how many they had built. In group two, they said, would you like to build another robot? And if they said yes, then they dismantled the robot took it apart and handed them the pile of pieces and said, here you go, build another one. Now they all knew that this was just an experiment. They all knew that at the end of the day that all the robots were going to be destroyed. But group two got to see the destruction of what they had just built immediately before they built the next one. Whereas the first group got to see them all lying. Would that make a difference? Some of these people really love Legos. So Dan Aerley said, if you take people who love something and place them in meaningful working conditions, the joy they derive from the activity is going to be a major driver in dictating their level of effort. However, if you take the same people with the same initial passion and desire and place them in meaningless, working conditions, you can easily kill any joy. They didn't want to build any more robots. They watched every single thing they did torn down in front of them. And it was just an experiment. Some of the most exciting research I have seen recently 
is from Teresa Amabile and her husband, Ned Parker. The study group that they had for several years were all software developers, so that was even more exciting. This is directly applicable to the kind of work that we do. And the message in this book is that of all the events that can deeply engage people in their jobs, the most important is making progress in meaningful work. They found out in the study that most people do care. We have a feeling every now and then that maybe most people are a little bit skeptical, resentful, not happy in what they do. That's not true. Most people enjoy what they do and are reasonably <coughs> happy. And that this relationship between being happy in what they do and having joy leads to teams that are more creative, more productive, who are committed to the work, who get along with them, other people on their team. And the last finding out of all of this uh, research is that what you have in front of you, the team that you work with and your immediate boss are so much more important than what goes on at the corporate level, that that's actually a measurable difference. So that what we can do for our teams is give them clear goals to say, here's what we're trying to do. And as managers, if there are managers in the room, encourage people by getting out of their way, helping them make progress. We used to call that being a servant leader. Pitch in, help. And then there's a wonderful pattern from Fearless Change called Celebrate Small Successes. Find the joy, even little tiny celebrations. So what we know, I hope, is that there's a lot of research that shows incentives will not get you what you want. It's not about the right carrot or the right stick. It's about purpose. It's about making progress, seeing that you're reaching goals every day. It's about joy. We know that celebrating small successes is a powerful way to move forward. So I hope that this has been okay as a start for the conference, that maybe you've learned a little, maybe a couple of things you can take back. Yes? Maybe? Good? Okay. So if you have questions, I'll be here for the next two days. And Thank you, Linda. Pleasure.